I think it's ironic that right now, one group says this is a civil rights issue, but no, you can't vote on it. You can't vote on my civil rights, you can't vote. When my father was threatened at gunpoint, people were killed and lynched over the fact that they could not vote. And it looks like we're telling all these people in the city, you have no civil rights because my civil rights mm -hmm. are so important. This is Faith Complex, a dialogue about the entanglement of religion, politics and art. Hello, my name is Jacques Berlinerblau of Georgetown University and you're watching Faith Complex. Joining us today is Bishop Harry Jackson. He is senior pastor of Hope Christian Church and chairman of the Stand for Marriage DC Coalition. He's also the author of Personal Faith and Public Policy. Bishop Jackson, welcome to Faith Complex. Thank you for having me, sir. Tell us about the Stand for Marriage DC Coalition. We hear a lot about this in the news. <laughs> a lot about well, it. Well, and you know what? I, I wish we weren't hearing so much about it. It's a funny story. Um, we started this group as a result of my sitting in the city council chambers uh, back in April and hearing the whole same-sex marriage debate. And um, at that point, a reciprocity was what they were looking at, acknowledging marriages from other localities. And I really felt that there really was a lack of due process, that this was going to be uh, decided by the council only. People wouldn't have gotten any chance to vote. So I talked with some friends, left the meeting, started the Stand for Marriage group, along with several other national and local groups. All right, so what was the marriage initiative of 2009? Well, that was really defining marriage as simply a union between a man and a woman. And obviously, if you define it that way, right. you would exclude uh, gay marriage in the mix. And the reason we did it is we felt like when you redefine marriage, there are all kind of unintended consequences, such as family gets redefined, therefore parenting, who adopts kids, how that works gets redefined. Education of necessity is redefined in what can be taught at eight years old or in the eighth grade, what sex education looks like. And we're gonna take the thing to the highest levels only because our real premise is that the people in the District of Columbia have a right based on the charter to bring forth an initiative or a referendum. This is a question of process. It's a question of process. Okay. And I, I just can't understand how folks are saying, well, the charter, which is tantamount to a uh, constitution of, of a state or a constitution of a nation, well, we're gonna ignore the charter because of a, a rule or an act that was essentially a subsequent law. It doesn't make sense, it's not good law, shouldn't stand. Let's clarify the record, mm -hmm. right? I'm sure that you're gonna say you are definitely not anti-gay. Yep. You are not homophobic. Yep, as far as I can tell. <laughs> Finish the <laughs> sentence for us. You're simply well, opposed to? I'm simply opposed to the redefinition of a foundational structure in culture without there really being proof that this is not going to destroy mm. marriage. Think about it this way from an African-American perspective. I, I pastor a multiracial church, but today in DC, 40% of young black women will never be married. Um, you're gonna have seven or eight of our babies born out of wedlock here in DC. You're gonna have 40% of the pregnancies terminated by abortion here in this uh, district. And so we're in this unique place where everywhere else the same-sex marriage has been legalized, there is an acceleration mm -hmm. of out-of-wedlock births, an acceleration of people who wait to get married till later. But the gay marriage isn't depriving African-American women of male partners, is it? I don't see the correlation no, no. between those. The correlation is, if you'll follow some of the studies by guys like Dr. Stanley Kurtz of Harvard, mm -hmm. or Harvard trained guy, um, that when this dynamic happens, evidently there's a subtle uh, doctor, there's a subtle uh, devaluation of the institution. Mm -hmm. Now, in my life, I've seen some very, very healthy gay marriages. I've seen some of my gay friends being Wonderful. deacons in their church. Surely you wouldn't want to deprive society of that possibility. Well, what I'm doing is, in my view, 
protecting uh, an institution versus um, trying to prevent someone from the kind mm -hmm. of expression that you see. You've spoken about some of your processual concerns with yeah. the way the um, initiative was brought to the ballot or not brought to the ballot. Yes, sir. You've cited some psychological studies, uh, which seem mm -hmm. extremely interesting to me. What about some of the theological concerns that you bring to the fore? Is there a theological predicate of your opposition to gay marriage? Well, well you, you, you know there is. Um, and, and thank you for coming to that last, because I think <clears throat> all too often, we as men of the cloth, when we approach these issues, we come out with, with, with the theology first, and I think that that really hurts the discussion in the, uh, in the public square. Mm. I think my views religiously are mine, it should be for our parishioners, they should inform our debate in the culture, but we should not mandate our belief system. Mm. That being said, I believe the Bible is very clear <clears throat> on its teachings against same-sex marriage. Um, as it relates to first the whole homosexual lifestyle. Now that's not where we start or finish publicly. I think my public issue is the people should vote on it. And if the District of, of Columbia voted to have same-sex marriage, I'd be applauding the democratic process. The gay 